Hello friends. So as you can see, I have a whole assortment of different PC monitors and TV sets here on the workbench. And what I'm going to show you in this video is how you can connect a Raspberry Pi and that also goes for model two and three and possibly for those that will come in the future. And the most modern device that I have here is this Samsung brand 16 to nine aspect ratio LCD monitor with LED backlight. And I bought that in 2011 as a new item. The second monitor is a four to five aspect ratio LCD monitor with cold cathode fluorescent lighting backlight and that is from around 2005. Here we have, and this is also a Fujitsu Siemens brand monitor, a CRT monitor from around the year 2000. This is a Samsung brand TV set with a CRT from 1988. And here in the left corner, you can see a rather stylish Vega brand German TV set from the year 1980. But before I can show you how I connected the Raspberry Pi to each individual TV or monitor, we have to talk about the little differences in the layout of the different models of the Raspberry Pi. Here we have a top view of the Raspberry Pi 1 Model B and you can see in this red square that it had a yellow RCA jack for the composite video output. Now the models 2 and 3 still deliver composite video output but in order to get that signal out of the board you have to connect a 3.5 mm headphone plug with four poles to the headphone jack on the board. And ideally you would buy an adapter cable just like this one, which gives you the two analog audio output channels and the composite video on a yellow RCA connector. But before you buy something like this online, check out that it has exactly the pin out that you can see in this picture here. Especially in Germany and maybe other European countries, there are cables that look just like that, but where you just have a different wiring diagram. And at least for the German viewers, I will put a link to a fitting cable into the video description. And I ordered just such an adapter cable, but it didn't arrive in time. So I had to use an old composite video cable and solder that to the pins of the audio jack on the bottom side of the board. And I do not recommend to do that, but if you want to do it this way, you can see here in the video where you can find a connection to the ground and to the composite video output. But we will only need the composite video output later in the video. For now, let us take a look at the first monitor and try to connect the Raspberry Pi to it. Here on the back side of the first LCD monitor, we can find the various connectors and we find an HDMI jack for digital video and audio input, a DVI jack for digital and potentially also analog video input, a D sub jack for VGA analog video input, a 3.5 mm audio jack for analog video output and an optical digital audio output. And these audio signals, both digital and analog, are derived from the HDMI input, of course. And since the Raspberry Pi has an HDMI video output, it's really easy to connect it via this short HDMI cable, for example, to the monitor. And you can just start up the Raspberry Pi and operate it without any problems at all. But what about the smaller of the two LCD monitors? Well, when we take a look at the back side of this monitor, we can see that it only has one VGA analog video input. And in order to connect these two devices, we can use an HDMI to VGA converter like this one, which I bought for around 10 euros. And it needs its own USB power supply, and it also has an audio output jack here on the back side. As I read on the internet, with some HDMI to VGA converters, it is necessary to uncomment some lines in the config file of the Raspberry Pi, which is kind of the BIOS equivalent of the Raspberry Pi. But in this particular case, and with this converter in this screen, it was not necessary to do so. But what about the old CRT monitor? Well, on the back side of this device, we can find another D sub connector and five individual BNC connectors. And maybe you will find an old monitor that only has the BNC connectors. And in that case, I would simply try to get my hands on a BNC to D sub 
adapter cable like this one and then connect the whole thing to the HDMI to VGA converter. But in this case, we can simply hook that converter up to the VGA port and ta-da, as you can see here, works just as fine as with the VGA LCD monitor. So this flickering here and also opaque lines or opaque areas on the screen and stuff like that that you will see throughout this video come from filming the surface of the CRT at a certain frame rate. They are not real. They cannot be seen by my eyes while I film this. And now it gets really interesting with our 1988 Samsung CRT TV set. And here we can see the various jacks that the TV set is equipped with. In the middle, the 21-pin SCART connector, in America I guess also known as EXT, which uh, was here in Germany and large parts of Europe the most common connector for audio-video equipment until a couple of years back. And here on the left we have the antenna or aerial input for the radio frequency signal from cable TV or the antenna that people used to have on their roofs. These two RCA connectors are for analog audio input of an external source. These are loudspeaker connectors for external loudspeakers. And the two switches are to select between internal external loudspeakers and between mono and stereo mode. Here on the left you also find a rather rare thing, a BNC connector labeled VCR. And I'm pretty sure that this is just a composite video input that uses a BNC instead of an RCA. But I'm just guessing here because I haven't seen that too often and I don't have an owner's manual for this particular TV. Now the SCART connector has 21 pins with lots of functions, but pin 20 is composite video in and 21 is ground. And that's actually the only two pins you need to attach a composite video source. And if I was really cheap, I could now simply solder some wires to those pins and attach the Raspberry Pi to that. But a more convenient way to do it is to buy a SCART to RCA adapter like this. And I recommend one with a switch where you can choose between in and out. Because with some SCART to RCA adapters, the yellow RCA jack is hardwired to pin 19, which is composite out, not in. So you cannot use those for this purpose. But with the help of the adapter with the switch, we can now connect the Raspberry Pi to the old TV. We switch it to AV or channel zero and there you go. And by the way, if you're using a European TV like this, you have to switch the Raspberry Pi's composite video out to PAL instead of NTSC. And I will show you how you do that in the end of this video. But what about this really beautiful 1980 Vega TV? I mean, it would be so cool to have some kind of purpose for it. But let's take a look at the back side. And here we see only three connectors. On the left, an antenna connector. In the middle, a DIN connector for an external loudspeaker. And on the right, we have a DIN 5-pole connector for external sound sources. So in other words, the only way to get a video signal in here is via the antenna input. But how do you do that? Well, let's just take a look at how they did it in the past. This is the PAL version of the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, SNES. And on the back side we can see a proprietary multi-purpose connector, which among other things includes a composite video output. But we also find another jack that says RF out, and this is an RF modulator, to be more precise a VHF, very high frequency modulator, for the channels 3 and 4 and it can be directly connected to the antenna input of an old TV like this. Okay, so the Super Nintendo is a kind of a computer and it is connected via an RF modulator to this old TV. So how can we implement this technique for the Raspberry Pi? Well, let me show you. 
Well, back in the day, at least here in Germany, about every VCR came with its own RF modulator. Well, these modulators were typically UHF modulators, so they used a higher frequency band than the VHF modulator in the SNES that was built for channels 3 and 4. So the ones that you can salvage here are more likely to be for channel 25 or something. But even quite old TVs, at least here in Germany, already had a UHF that is for ultra high frequency tuner built inside. So here you can see me tearing down this LG VCR here. But this particular device that I'm salvaging here is not really all that well suited. I recommend you to go for really old VCRs and not these relatively recent ones. And inside these older VCRs, you will often find an RF modulator just like this one. They often have just five pins or so. And here you can see the typical pin out of these little modules and how you can hook them up to reuse them. So let me briefly explain the different features of an RF modulator like this. This connector is where optionally your actual aerial would be connected. This is the RF output that goes to the aerial input of your TV. This switch can be used to switch between a test screen and the actual video input. This little screw here can be used to fine tune the carrier frequency. And I guess that this little adjustable filter here can be used to fine tune the audio signal. But I'm not sure about that anymore. So I have now connected this little modulator according to the wiring diagram that I have shown you and to the Raspberry Pi's composite video output and now I plugged it in into the aerial input of this TV here. And we're going to do this with this one first because the whole setup is already on the table here. So as you can see, it does work, but obviously the quality is again worse than when using the composite video input in the SCART jack on the backside of the TV. And here I'm trying to adjust the carrier frequency of the RF modulator a little bit so that we get a little bit of a better picture, but there's only so much you can do with this completely improvised setup. So what I did before is to orderly solder it onto a piece of perf board and have only very short wires and shield them and so on. And then I also bought this uh, kit and built this device here years ago. And yeah, you can also just order for a couple of bucks an RF modulator online. But what I did now is to order yet another kit for a PLL controlled modulator that I guess will deliver much better quality than the one I used before. And here I am building the whole thing up. And for the German viewers, I will put a link to this kit, which only costs 10 euros in the video description. So let's try it with this improved modulator then. So does any of this make any sense? Well, I don't know, but it's fun as hell. And it's really kind of a good idea, I guess, if you want to recreate that arcade feeling or playing like retro games on the Raspberry Pi, you know, having a TV like this running on that machine would be pretty awesome. And that's what I made that for. And of course, there are a lot of things that can be done to adjust the operating system to be like running on a low resolution screen of this type, changing the colors, the fonts, everything. But I really can't go into that right now. 
But one thing that I still wanted to show you is how you can set your composite video output from NTSC to PAL and also how you can adjust the size of the picture on the CRT screen. So you open the Raspbian terminal and you type in sudo nano slash boot slash config dot txt. And by doing that you get into the config file and there you have to look for the line saying uncommon for composite pal. And if there is a hash in front of sdtv mode equals two, then you have to delete that hash and save that by going to the end of the file, hitting control X and then Y for yes and enter. And yes, here in this footage, I'm actually doing it the other way around because I already removed that hash long time ago. And another thing that I still wanted to show you because you will probably need it is that you can use overscan in order to resize the actual image size on the CRT. Because you can see here on the left side that not the entire area of the terminal can be seen on the screen. And that is because it is not well adjusted. Now in the config file, you will find these lines with hash and then overscan. And if you remove those hashes, you can resize the screen area. And if you type in a bigger number here, I'm typing in 30 instead of 16 and have rebooted now. And here you can see that actually everything can be seen now. Okay, so much about that. I'm sorry if this wasn't perfect, but I really caught a bad cold this week, as you can also probably hear. And I'm really tired now. And I just hope that you like this silly little idea and this video and hope to see you soon.